Therefore, it is time for question period. The member from Whitby, Oshawa. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. I was pleased to see earlier today the government announced details of the College Student Support Fund. It's the right thing for colleges to give the net strike savings back to the students caught in the middle the last five weeks. But, Speaker, the government let this college strike drag on and on. And it's time for the Liberal government to right their wrong. Will the government commit today to matching the College Student Support Fund dollar for dollar? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I appreciate the question from the member opposite, and I know that the minister uh, is going to want to speak to the specifics of the college fund. But let me just say this: that our focus all along has been on students, Mr. Speaker. We are very pleased to see the students back in the classroom as of tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, I think that uh, on on a number of issues, there are questions that need to be asked about the process, Mr. Speaker, particularly about the uh, the uh, the the way the uh, the process unfolded and uh, and the uh, array, the authority of uh, some of the uh, bodies involved mr speaker we are going to we are going to ask those questions um, in order to make sure that uh, so that students don't get caught in this way again and that collective bargaining can uh, can take place mr speaker but we do have questions that we need to ask about the process as it unfolds Answer. this time thank you supplementary uh, back uh, to the premier speaker for the five weeks students were shut out of the classroom, they had a long time to think, Speaker. And let me tell you, I've heard from countless students that they're disillusioned. They've lost faith in the democratic process. The government needs to put money where their mouth is. Once again, Speaker, will the government today commit to matching the $500 per student fund dollar for dollar? Okay. Mr. Speaker, I know that um, I know that the minister will want to speak to the uh, specifics of the fund, but Mr. Speaker, I have to I have to recognize that this is this question is coming from a member of a party that really doesn't support collective bargaining. The fact is, we do support collective bargaining, Mr. Speaker. We believe it's an important part of our democratic. I. Uh... Evident, start the clock. Evidence is presenting itself that I may have to pick up where I left off, and I will. And quickly. If that's a challenge, I'll be up to the challenge. If it continues, I'll start. Premier. Mr. Speaker, we believe that collective bargaining is an important part of our democratic process. Mr. Speaker, the uh, the action that we took was a last resort, Mr. Speaker, because there was no foreseeable agreement, Mr. Speaker, and we are very pleased that students will be back in class tomorrow. We are in warnings. You asked, I will give it to you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. For five weeks, students weren't getting the schooling they were paying for. For five weeks, students missed out on potential earnings. For five weeks, students were forced to sell their personal belongings to make ends meet. For five weeks, Speaker, students were put through unmeasurable financial stress. Speaker, will the government do the right thing today? Will the government commit to matching the call of students' fund dollar for a dollar. You. Proceed it, please. Proceed it, please. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Advanced Education and Skills Development. Education and Skills Development. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And um, I was pleased this morning to be able to announce more details of the Hardship Fund. Uh, Full time students will be able to receive up to $500. <coughs> the member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Carry on. For unexpected uh, uh, costs that they have incurred, such as additional childcare fees, rebooked uh, train or bus tickets, January rent, uh, students can start applying for that uh, later this week. Speaker, in addition, we have uh, uh, for o students receiving OSAP, they will have, and th if they're receiving OSAP and are having their winter semesters extended past the normal end date, they will receive additional OSAP for that uh, length of the extension. 
And speaker, well, it, it is our sincere hope that students will remain enrolled in their program. Yes, sir. There will be some students who will withdraw. We will uh, refund their tuition, and there will be no academic penalty. Thank you. New question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Premier. Uh, Speaker, last week, Premier Wynne's $4.5 million man, Mayo Schmidt, the CEO of Hydro One, was back in the news again. As he delivered remarks at the Empire Club, the $4.5 million man was calling for higher hydro rates once again. In fact, Hydro One is requesting higher hydro rates right now. So, Mr. Speaker, will the government promise that they will stop this proposed hydro rate hike now? Mr. Of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, so let me talk about something that I'm sure the um, um, member from the opposition hasn't read, and it's called the Fair Hydro Plan. And in the Fair Hydro Plan, he should be aware that no matter the outcome of the application brought forward by Hydro One, the rate application will be held to the cost of inflation for the next four years, Mr. Speaker. That's make sure that we can keep rates as low as possible. We've reduced them by 25 percent, and I'm sure that he hasn't heard that as well, Mr. Speaker, because that is helping every single family in this province. We've reduced rates by 25 percent, and as I mentioned, we're making sure that we're holding these rates to the cost of inflation for the next four years. Hydro One and its application, Mr. Speaker, are being brought forward it's being brought to the OEB. The OEB is going to review the application, but the costs will stay at the rate of inflation, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. Supplementary. So it sounds to me, Speaker, like the government is prepared to let that 5% increase in hydro rates go ahead. They'll just borrow billions of dollars more to make sure that it doesn't appear on bills now. But we know, because we have read the unfair Liberal hydro plan, Mr. Speaker, that the rates are going to skyrocket after the next election. That's according to their own cabinet documents. The Hydro One CEO makes $4.5 million. Then he gives a speech at a swanky downtown Toronto hotel. And what does he tell the audience? How this is justifiable when Hydro One service has become less reliable but more expensive. The auditor says because of aging equipment, we have a higher risk of failing infrastructure. That really just goes to show how out of touch that this government has become. So, Mr. Speaker, if the government won't stop the rate hike, it looks like they're prepared to borrow billions of dollars more to pay for it. Will the Premier at least tell the people of Ontario that she doesn't support Question. this rate hike? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As usual, say one thing and do another from the other side. So when, when the Hydro One executive was awarded the OEA Finish, please. When the Hydro One CEO was awarded the Ontario Electricity or Energy Association's Leader of the Year, which he attended, he stood and applauded with everyone else, Mr. Speaker, and now he stands in here to slam the CEO. The CEO that has found $75 million in savings. The CEO that is actually changing the company to make sure that they're more customer focused, Mr. Speaker. Let's talk about what Hydro One is doing to ensure that they can continue to operate and be customer focused, Mr. Speaker. They've actually voluntarily ended winter disconnections. They voluntarily Answer. returned security deposits, Mr. Speaker. They're doing a great job as a company and making sure that they keep the lights on right across the province. Member from Niagara West Glanbrook is warned. Final supplementary. Speaker, I'm going to say this really slowly. slowly very, very clearly. We are not criticizing the CEO of Hydro One. We're criticizing this premier and this government who gave him a salary of four and a half billion dollars, ten times what his counterparts are receiving in other parts and other provinces of Canada. Mr. Speaker, the government sits across from us and claims that they've rebuilt the system. What a crock! because the CEO at Hydro One is standing up before an audience downtown saying the reason he has to come to them now looking for a nearly 5% increase is because of aging infrastructure and the government hasn't repaired what they said that they have repaired. They haven't modernized the system. If they'd done what they claimed, the $4.5 million man wouldn't be asking for more money to do just that, would he? Mr. Speaker, why is the Premier's $4.5 million man 
trying to hike hydro rates to apparently rebuild the system if the Liberals already have rebuilt the system. Minister. Again, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. Always pleased to talk about and remind the opposition about the Fair Hydro Plan and which rates are being held to the cost of inflation for the next four years. We've also seen a 25 per cent reduction for every single family and household right across the province. On top of that, Mr. Speaker, we've got families that live in rural and northern parts of our community that are seeing anywhere between 40 and 50 percent. Wow. And I know, Mr. Speaker, we're getting up and close to around 300 days since they said they might talk about a plan, maybe show us something, even an iota of what they would do, Mr. Speaker, but they don't because they have no idea, no idea on what to do to help those folks uh, that are suffering, Mr. Speaker, right now with higher energy bills. That's why we brought forward the Fair Hydro Plan. That's why we voted in favour of it, Mr. Speaker, and that's why they'll continue to vote against anything that will help the people of Ontario. Thank you. Okay. No question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. This weekend, the Liberal government teamed up with the Conservatives and passed legislation to trample on the rights of college faculty. The Premier has underfunded colleges for years, Speaker, laying the groundwork for this strike in the first place. But instead of getting involved, which the law gives her every right to do, she refused, letting down students and letting down faculty members. Now she's forced faculty back to work with no plan to fix the mess that she's created in our colleges. Why didn't the Premier exercise her legal right to direct the employer and avoid this strike in the first place, Speaker? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party is wrong on a number of fronts, Mr. Speaker, including uh, what I had the authority to do or not do, Mr. Speaker. And I just said in a question earlier uh, to the, uh, the opposition party that there are many questions that come out of this process, and one of them is exactly what those authorities should be and how we can move to uh, make the process more rational, Mr. Speaker, so that collective bargaining can take place, Mr. Speaker, but that students would not be caught in a situation like this again. Those are questions that need to be answered. But, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party is just wrong that those authorities are in place at this point. Mr. Speaker, we supported the collective bargaining process. We wanted both parties to reach agreement at the table. When the final offer was vote was not accepted, Mr. Speaker, Minister Matthews and I brought both parties Answer. together, Mr. Speaker, and it was very clear that there was not going to be an agreement reached by the parties. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, if the Premier had no authority, how did she have the authority to bring the parties back together on Thursday of last week? Sections 4 and 5 of the Colleges of Applied Arts and Technology Act allow the government to get involved to facilitate bargaining if it's deemed to be in the public interest. Right. The Liberal government, for example, had the legal authority to direct colleges to reduce the number of part-time precarious employees they hire, removing one of the single biggest obstacles to getting an agreement. Why didn't the Liberal government do this, Speaker? Thank you, Speaker. Again, the leader of the third party is just wrong. Yeah. That is not the issue that was the roadblock to an agreement, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. That issue had been taken off the table and was going to be discussed separately. The leader of the third party does not understand, Mr. Speaker, how the law works in this instance. We, we left it until the last moment. The minister and I invited the parties to come and talk to us, Mr. Speaker, and only when we understood that there was no possibility of an agreement did we ask them, or did we tell them that we were going to move forward with legislation, and that's what we did. Mr. Speaker, the solution of the third party would have been to let that bargaining go on forever and keep those students out of class indefinitely. Unacceptable, not a solution, not what we would have done. Please. 
Speaker, it's not, uh, it's not um, information to anyone in this province that the Liberal government left this to the very last minute. Everybody had to pay the price for the fact that the Liberal government left this to the very last minute. Speaker, public interest is defined in the Act as the, quote, quality of education and training services provided to students. It's not too late for the Premier to take responsibility and use her legislative authority to help— Stop the clock. Minister of Economic Development and Growth is warned. Carry on. It's not too late to help have her authority used to help improve college education in Ontario. This clearly falls within the definition of public interest under the law. Will the Premier direct the employer to include in their submission for the arbitrator a plan to reduce the number of part-time precarious employees that they hire? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I understand why the leader of the third party would want to focus on what now actually rests in the hands of the parties and the uh, and the arbitrator, Mr. Speaker, because she doesn't want to acknowledge that she had no solution for getting those students back into the classroom, short of having a, a collective agreement process that would go on for a collective bargaining that would go on forever, Mr. Speaker. And she also doesn't want to acknowledge that. The students could have been back in the class today, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, they could have right. been back in class today if the NDP had not chosen to take their route. We left it till the very end of the process, Mr. Speaker. We believe in collective bargaining when there was no option, when it was clear that there was going to be no resolution, Mr. Speaker. Then we acted to get students back as quickly as possible. The NDP stood in the way of that. Uh, expeditious, pro expedited process, Mr. Speaker. But the students will be back in class tomorrow, and that's as it should be. Thank you. New question. Here, my next question is also for the Premier. New Democrats are glad that colleges are open today, but I'm disgusted. I'm disgusted that the Premier allowed. Order. <laughs> Leader. I'm disgusted that the Premier allowed this strike to drag on for five weeks. Stop the clock. The Minister of Indigenous Relations and uh, Reconciliation is warned. Please finish. While doing nothing at all. Students paid the price for the Premier's inaction, Speaker. They paid academically, emotionally, and financially. Today, we're hearing that the Premier is capping the hardship fund that she promised students. Does this Premier believe that $500 is enough to fix the chaos that she created in students' lives? Of advanced education and you know, Speaker, some days sitting in this house is a, a surreal experience, and I think we just saw one of those moments. Yesterday, the NDP made it very clear that they would not have legislated. <coughs> Finish, please. Speaker, we can check answered. Yesterday, the member from Welland made it very clear that the NDP would never have legislated them back, that they would never have imposed uh, the end of the strike, Speaker. And now to hear the Leader of the Opposition say she's pleased that students are back, that colleges are open, when they are not, they could have been, Speaker, if they had decided on Thursday or on Answer. Friday to support the legislation that uh, ordered those workers back to work, Speaker. Uh, we, they, the students would be in the classroom. Thank They're you. not. And, Speaker, there's only one. Thank you. Final supplement. Speaker, what New Democrats would never have done is allow our colleges to be so underfunded that they fell to the back of the pack in all of Canada when it comes to per-student funding. The Premier promised this assistance, this fund, to students weeks ago, and today she's letting students down once again. Students deserve to be compensated fully for the costs that they occurred as a result of this Premier's inaction for more than five weeks. Will the Premier take full responsibility and get rid of the cap, get rid of the cap that she's imposed on the Student Support Fund? 
Well, Speaker, of, of course, had the strike gone on longer, those costs would have been higher. But let me repeat, Speaker, some of the highlights of what we have announced today. Full-time students will be eligible to receive up to $500 for unexpected incremental costs associated with the strike. That could be childcare, it could be an extra month's rent, it could be rebooked uh, travel plans to get home for Christmas speaker. That fund, uh, colleges will be opening uh, applications for that fund later this week. Another issue we heard from students, speaker, these are all initiatives driven by consultation with students. Um, some students have been very concerned that uh, they've missed the withdrawal date, Speaker, that if they did choose not to complete the semester, that they would have a zero on their transcript Answer. rather than a withdrawal. There will be no academic penalty and full tuition refund, including the deposit, Speaker, for students who make the choice to Thank withdraw you. after the strike. Here, here. Final supplementary. Students were forced to put their lives on hold for five weeks because the Premier and her Liberal government sat on their hands and watched the faculty strike escalate. Now today, after promising relief, the Premier is offering nothing but further confusion, chaos and hardship. Will the Premier and her government speaker be requiring the colleges to provide enhanced, enhanced— Minister of Infrastructure is warned. Carry on. We do. Will the Premier and her government be requiring colleges to provide enhanced mental health and academic counselling services to help students cope with the mess they've left them in? Thank you. Minister. Well, Speaker, it's wonderful to hear the, uh, the NDP talking about students for once. I think in the speeches yesterday, there was only one mention, uh, the member from Welland, one mention of the word student, and that was when she was quoting Minister Flynn. Uh, so, Speaker, uh, we have, uh, in consultation with students, with student leaders across the province and with colleges, we have responded to the concerns of students. I'm pleased with the package. I think our students will be pleased with this package. There has been tremendous uncertainty. They are happy that there is now certainty that classes will resume tomorrow. But, Speaker, I'm not sure they will ever forgive the NDP for, ask, for blocking uh, return to, to school. Thank you. The question, the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The government has made a commitment on mental health, but I'm hearing from mental health service providers that you've ignored the treatment. There are so many who need counselling that can't get it. The government is failing them. If a child in this province breaks a leg, they are treated immediately. Yet kids with serious mental health issues, some are even suicidal, are left waiting for treatment. Mr. Speaker, why is the government turning a blind eye to the real needs of our young people who face a mental health challenge? Why are these, de why are these delays allowed in the province of Ontario? Can the Premier enlighten us? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, we are absolutely committed to providing the highest quality mental health services for all of Ontarians, regardless of whether they where they reside in this province, regardless of their age, Mr. Speaker. Member from Hamilton Mountain is warned. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, we, uh, uh, as recently as this spring's budget, we announced an additional $140 million for mental health services in a variety of ways. And these are $140 million that that member voted against. It includes the creation of up to 10 new youth wellness hubs to provide that, those wraparound supports that young people require at various times uh, as they uh, grow into successful adults, Mr. Speaker. It included $72 million for structured psychotherapy, Answer. so that we're the first province in all of Canada to provide programs for cognitive behavioural therapy, Mr. Speaker, and I'll here, here. talk more about that in the Thank supplementary. You. supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, again to the Premier. Uh, for the last 10 years, Asia Masudi has struggled to get help for depression and anxiety issues. She spoke to uh, CBC and Global to tell her story in the hopes that this wouldn't happen to other young people in the province of Ontario. And I, I told the family that we would raise this directly with the Premier. 
In fact, ASIA has attempted suicide a number of times. The reality is ASIA, like tens of thousands of youth in the province, can't get mental health treatment when they need it. I know the Minister of Health and the Premier say everything is rosy, but, Mr. Speaker, it's not good enough. In some parts of the province, kids are waiting 18 months to get publicly funded counselling. They say everything's fine. Imagine not having the courage to come forward with a mental health issue and being told, come back in 18 months. That's not the Ontario I know. That's not the Ontario that we should be. And so my, question, my question directly to the Premier, I hope that it's not passed off, is to, to a young Ontario like Asia, are you going to continue to let them down? Can I count on the Thank government you. to actually invest in mental health? Like Thank you. You say the first. You say the first. Thank you, Minister. To the uh, Minister of Children and Youth Services. Sir, Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the, uh, the question from the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, earlier this year we passed Bill 89, and uh, the Leader of the Opposition and his party voted against that bill. And in that specific bill, it lays out our moving on mental health strategy by, uh, by putting forward 33 lead agencies in Ontario to work on youth mental health. Mr. Speaker, we don't know why the Progressive Conservative Party voted against that bill. You know, we do have some clues. There were some members who were on the record saying that they voted against Bill 89 because the Campaign Life Coalition told them to do so. I want to know from the members' office, and that was the, that was the member from Niagara West uh, Glenbrook that said that. I want to know from the members' office why did you vote against Bill 89? That was a piece of legislation to support the well-being of children and youth here yes, in the sir. province of Ontario, specifically sure. around mental health. New question, the member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, while some students are relieved to be back in their classes this week, many are not. After five weeks of this government doing nothing to end this strike, many students would rather lose their semester than have to cram five weeks of content into two. This will be difficult for even the strongest students and almost impossible for students with special learning needs. Many students want a fresh start in the new year. With the complete semester they paid for, and they are demanding a full tuition refund. Speaker, will the Premier direct the colleges to provide a full tuition refund to every student who requests it, and not just students who are withdrawing from college completely because of the strike? Thank you, Mr. Premier. Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Well, Speaker, as I've said earlier, that if students do make the choice, and we hope that not many will, but we do respect if students want to make the choice to withdraw as a result of the strike, there will be a full tuition refund, including the deposit, Speaker, and there will uh, it will be recorded as a withdrawal on their transcript. There will be no academic penalty. You supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I'm not talking about students who withdraw from college. I'm talking about students who want to start again in January with a new semester. Speaker, many students are in an absolute panic. They are not only stressed about the academic pressure of a compressed and accelerated semester, they are also worried about having to relearn content they were taught back in September. The crisis in campus mental health means that students struggling with anxiety and depression will be returning to campus without adequate supports to help them. They face the grueling prospect of a high-pressure year, a shortened Christmas break, and no spring break to charge. Speaker, will the Premier commit today to making emergency and enhanced mental health supports available for the college students whose mental health and well-being has been jeopardized Question. because of this strike? Thank you. Well, Speaker, I think it's important that, uh, that people in positions of leadership, like every single person in this House, actually supports students. The colleges are doing a very good job working to uh, make sure that students can successfully com complete their semester. Uh, they have recovery plans. Uh, to suggest that they're cramming five weeks' work into two weeks just simply isn't accurate, Speaker. It's our job to support those students who uh, to complete their semester, to get on with their lives. I have to say it's pretty rich hearing this coming from a party who said they would not ever 
order uh, workers back. Speaker, um, this strike had to come to an end. It was the right time. We had exhausted all op uh, other options, Speaker. So students will be back tomorrow, and yes, that's sir. a very good thing. Here, here. The member from Trinity Spadina. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. Uh, <laughs> Speaker, my riding of Trinity Spadina and our province as a whole has a very diverse population. In fact, Canada's 2016 census showed that more than half of Torontonians identified as uh, visible minorities. Speaker, this di diversity makes us a stronger and more successful province. However, we must recognize that many diverse and newcomers communities continue to experience barriers to inclusion that must be overcome to ensure that all Ontarians have the opportunity to fully participate in all aspects of life in our province. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can she tell us what is her ministry doing in helping community-based organizations who are in unique position to help newcomers, refugees, ethnocultural communities Question. get involved in our province's civic, cultural, and social and economic life? Thank, Thank you. you. Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Trinity Spadina for his question and his advocacy towards newcomers. Community-based community organizations work at the local level to improve the life of individuals. In June of this year, our ministry launched the Multicultural Community Capacity Grant uh, to help ethnocultural organizations advance diversity and reduce barriers to inclusion. I was very pleased to have the member from Trinity Spadina and the member for Beaches East York join me recently at the Regent Park Focus Youth Media Arts Centre in Toronto, where we announced the first recipients of the Multicultural Community uh, Capacity Great. Grant Program. Mr. Speaker, just over $3 million in grants ranging from $1,000 to $8,000 were awarded to 465 wow. worthy organizations yes, from across Ontario. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the Minister for her answer. It was wonderful to see the microcosm of society represented at the Regent Park Focus Youth Media Arts Centre last week. There was, a group, uh, there was a group of truly worthy organizations looking to promote diversity and inclusion, including a group for my own writing. Our writing, our writing had uh, 20 successful multicultural capacity grant applicants. I'm proud to represent a riding where so many are passionate about growing their community. Mr. Speaker, can the minister speak to the influx of applications for the program and how is her ministry will how her ministry will attempt to support the numerous groups from across the province who wish to help Question. To promote diversity and inclusion in Ontario? Thank you, Minister. And once again, I'd like to thank the member for his question. Mr. Speaker, our ministry was extremely pleased to see the high level of interest in the Multicultural Community Capacity Grant Program. While we'll be able to help many organizations like the ones highlighted by the member from Trinity Spadina, there are many more valuable projects uh, out there. And that's why I was pleased to also announce that the application process for the 2018-19 call for proposals is now open for eligible not-for-profits. Mr. Speaker, this grant is an excellent opportunity for organizations to facilitate community engagement, social integration, volunteerism, to promote social connections and employment networking. These modest grants support valuable and innovative projects that promote intercultural understanding. Yes, and reduce barriers to participation in community life. By working together, we make our organization stronger and more Thank inclusive, you. Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Energy. In my riding of Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, your ministry is pushing ahead with two new industrial wind turbine developments, the North Kent One and Otter Creek Wind Farms. These wind farms will generate electricity we don't need and contribute to pushing hydro bills even higher than they already are. These developments include turbines almost 200 metres high, with foundations that require pile driving into black shale bedrock, rock containing heavy metals. This bedrock carries water of the aquifer. Since the start of construction on the North Kent project, 14 water wells have become turbid and undrinkable. 
Mr. Speaker, we've seen the impact of pile driving into Black Shale from the North Kent project. Why is the minister allowing construction to continue there, and why is he jeopardizing the drinking water of another community by going forward with the Otter Creek project? Here, here. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, Speaker. And I, you know, I'm happy to speak in some generalities as well around uh, the need for wind turbines and, and the very vigorous uh, process that our government puts in place to make sure that uh, uh, the turbines are, are sited uh, uh, safely and that, uh, that there is a good, strong consultation with the community. You know, Speaker, we take, uh, we take the concerns regarding the environment and, and human health very seriously, and I'll say that uh, uh, we adhere to a very strict renewable energy approvals process. So, you know, Speaker, thanks to clean air and clean energy, and let me speak to the fundamentals for a second, Ontario has saved more than $4 billion in annual health and environmental costs because of our commitment, because of this government's commitment to clean energy. You know, unlike the PC Answer. speaker, we can't sit idly by. Renewable energy projects, they are a necessity and a crucial part of our low carbon switch, uh, speaker. And we're not Thank going to, to back down from our I stand, you sit. Supplementary. Well, back to the Minister of Energy. These wind farms will forever end food production on some of the best agricultural land in our country. And we're talking about an environmentally sensitive area, home to 24 species at risk and within a major flight path for migratory birds. It is fragmenting the bedrock, yeah. turning clear, clean water into dirty, undrinkable swill. Yet the project is going ahead, even though the government has suspended the large renewable procurement two process because there is no need for additional electricity. When the minister made that announcement in September of 2016, I said that North Kent 1 and Otter Creek should be cancelled as well. Yep. Had the minister cancelled these two projects, then the long-term savings would amount to $570 million. Wow. If stopping turbine construction makes economic, environmental and public health Question. sense, why would the Minister of Energy sign off on continuing to build industrial wind farms in my riding of Lambton Kent Middlesex? You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to follow up on the uh, the North Kent uh, wind farm. You know, again, I'm going to reiterate, Speaker, that our government takes these concerns regarding groundwater quality very seriously. The uh, the renewable energy approval process, in fact, requires proponents requires these proponents to undertake extensive consultation with municipalities, indigenous communities and the public, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and additionally, we have taken a very cautious science-based approach when with setting the standards for renewable energy projects in order to protect the health of Ontario people, uh, the Ontario people. You know, Speaker, uh, the proponent uh, in this case has done extensive monitoring prior to con uh, construction, and we're going to require them to continue to monitor the vibration data closely Answer. during construction and operation of the wind turbines. You know, uh, we require the company uh, to conduct additional water quality assessment, Speaker, and we have, uh, we're Thank keeping you. an eye on this. New question, member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Last week, the CEO of the privatized Hydro One defended sharp rate increases he's seeking to benefit investors. He told the Empire Club that the rate increases were needed for capital investments to keep the system reliable. But the Ontario Energy Board didn't believe this. They told Hydro One to reduce its revenue demands. Hydro One has basically refused and came back with nearly the same demand. Let's be clear, Hydro One is not seeking this money to improve service. It wants this money so it can build an empire, including its ridiculous $6 billion purchase of Avista. Why is the Premier allowing Hydro One to expand its monopoly at ratepayers' expense? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to um, Hydro One's uh, ask into the OEB, um, it is just that, Mr. Speaker. It's an ask, and the OEB will uh, um, do its due diligence and again review this uh, this application. But let's be clear, Mr. Speaker. The Fair Hydro Plan talks about the 25% reduction that we've brought forward for all families right across this province, all residences, Mr. Speaker, and then of course for 500,000 small businesses and farms. Um, that 25% is taking effect, and then the cost. Mr. Speaker, will rise only by the cost of inflation for the next four years. So, Mr. Speaker, Hydro One is looking at what its needs are. It put forward its plan to actually continue to make our system reliable. We spent $70 billion making sure that we could rebuild this system, Mr. Speaker, and we need to Answer. continue to maintain it. That's what this ask is about. The OEB will review it with always making sure that it keeps the best interests of customers in mind, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. <clears throat> Two years ago, the Premier promised that Hydro One would lower hydro rates <clears throat> excuse me, after it became a private corporation. But the privatized Hydro One refuses to lower rates even, even after the Premier gave it a $2.6 billion tax cut. In fact, Hydro One is taking the Ontario Energy Board to court so it can keep 100 per cent of that tax break and leave nothing for ratepayers. It's refusing to be regulated by the OEB and is demanding sharp rate increases in order to expand its monopoly, while doing nothing to improve its performance for Ontario families and businesses. Will the Premier finally admit that her sell-off of Hydro One has been a complete failure? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the ownership of, of Hydro One does not change how rates are reviewed by the OEB, Mr. Speaker. It also does not change the fact that rates will only go up by the rate of inflation, Mr. Speaker, not by the fear-mongering coming from the NDP. But let's look very clearly at what's happened with Hydro One rates, Mr. Speaker. Hydro One urban customers have seen a 25 per cent reduction, Mr. Speaker, wow. just like every other family right across the province. On top of that, Mr. Speaker. The rates for Hydro One R1 and R2 customers have dropped between 40 and 50 percent, Mr. Speaker. That is a huge reduction for those families. On top of that, Mr. Speaker, Hydro One has voluntarily stepped forward and cancelled the winter disconnections. They stepped forward and voluntarily um, ended the security That's deposits, it. Mr. Speaker. When it comes to seeing a, co a company grow, they were actually growing and becoming more customer focused and making sure the money that we got from the broadening of the ownership that we could Thank use you. to build infrastructure right across the province. Your question, the member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. November the 19th to the 25th is Bullying Awareness and Prevention Week. Our government is taking steps to address and prevent bullying in Ontario schools, including in my riding of Kitchener Centre. Speaker, in 2012, we passed the Accepting Schools Act that requires school boards to introduce measures to prevent and address inappropriate student behaviour. This very important piece of legislation is intended to make every school in Ontario a safe, inclusive and accepting place to learn, while at the same time supporting every student to have the right supports to reach their full potential. Speaker, could the minister please tell this House how we are supporting safe schools during the school year and especially during Bully Awareness Question. Prevention Week? Thank you. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I'm, I'm pleased to rise in the House this morning to recognize Bullying Awareness Prevention Week that begins today. And I want to thank the member from Kitchener Centre. I know that uh, when the Premier first appointed me as Minister of Education, I had an opportunity to visit a brand new school, Vista Hills Public School, in your riding. And, uh, and how thrilled was I in, in that safe, accepting, and inclusive school environment where all school leaders were focused on. Uh, a safe and accepting school environment. Mr. Speaker, our government believes in supporting student achievement and well-being with a safe, inclusive and accepting learning environment for all students. As Minister of Education, I try to visit at least one school a week, and I have seen students, educators and families across Ontario working together to make our schools welcoming for everyone. In January, I visited L'Ecole Secondaire Publique de La Salle, Answer. and I saw 
how students, a student-led initiative was underway, including a gender-neutral washroom. Mr. Speaker, this week I'm encouraging educators across the province to spend time talking. Thank you. Supplementary. I'd like to thank the minister for her visit to my community recently. She was a big hit. Speaker, at an early age, Ontario students do learn how important it is to respect one another. This fosters a sense of success and belonging for all students. Schools are participating in Bullying Awareness and Prevention Week, affecting positive change in student achievement and well-being. For example, Collège Catholique Merbleu in Orleans has undertaken a school-wide initiative. It's focused on caring to increase kindness, empathy, and emotional support throughout the year. They're offering a series of classes speakers for all teachers and students, and in these weekly classes, they're learning about self-acceptance and cyberbullying prevention. This is a great example of a safe, inclusive, and accepting schools in action. Speaker, could the minister please tell us more Question. on how we're promoting safe and accepting schools and how we can all play a part in bullying awareness and prevention in Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, by promoting a respect, respect for all students, regardless of background, identity or personal circumstance, Ontario schools are fostering safe and inclusive places to learn. And as we recognize Bullying Awareness and Prevention Week, I am pleased to share with you that this year's Premier's Awards for accepting schools applications will be open. Mr. Speaker, these awards showcase the initiative, creativity and leadership that safe and accepting school teams have shown. To recognize the work of a safe and accepting schools team, I encourage all members of the school community to visit the Ministry of Education's website tomorrow when the nominations periods begin. I also encourage every member of this House to participate in anti-bullying activities planned this week in your local schools and to promote the Premier's Award for Safe and Accepting Schools. Let's work together yes, to make our schools a safe and accepting place for all students. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Perth, Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community and Social Services. Last spring, the government introduced Bill 148, making drastic changes to employment and labour laws. They did, they did no cost-benefit analysis. Speaker, no cost-benefit analysis. And now social service agencies face millions in new costs, unfunded yes, costs. Oasis, which represents nearly 200 agencies in the developmental services sector, told the government, and I quote, without increased funding to the sector by the relevant ministries, Bill 148 threatens the sector's ability to carry out its work. Right. It cannot be overstated that this will have an impact on the lives of the people served by this sector, end quote. Speaker, why did the minister not speak up against a bill that threatens the very people she's supposed Good to protect? Question. That's a great question. Minister of Community and Social Services. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I and we on this side of the House, of course, are extremely proud of Bill 148 and the types of protections that do are provided in that bill uh, for some of the workers uh, in our province who are working for um, minimal wage at the moment, at minimum wage, and also in precarious employment. So, of course, the provisions of this bill are extremely important to all vulnerable Ontarians, and in particular as it relates to the agencies uh, that my uh, ministry has transfer payment agreements with, of course we're working with them and looking at the impact that that bill uh, will have on services. Uh, that conversation continues, and we're extremely aware of uh, some of the comments that the agencies have made. Thank you, yes, Mr. Sir. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, the minister is not listening to Oasis and its members. It sounds like she's just speaking up for the premier. Many agencies have not seen a core funding increase for nine years, and now Oasis estimates that Bill 148 will add at least $55.96 million in new costs. One example, Community Living Toronto expects a reduction of 80,000 service hours a year uh, through the loss of 40-plus full-time positions. Oasis and others have made practical suggestions, but so far their efforts have been met with silence. I wrote the minister last summer about this issue, and she replied, and I quote, I have also heard the trepidation amongst agencies, but she offers no solution to offset their costs. 
If the minister can really hear the trepidation, why won't she do something about Question. it? Question. Thank here. you. Minister. Well, again, Mr. Speaker, we are very proud of uh, the provisions of Bill 148, and we certainly stand behind uh, our leader, and we're totally united on this side of the House uh, in terms of those important provisions. As it relates to the agencies, we're working with them, uh, we're listening to them. Uh, we are obviously looking at uh, potential impact on some of the uh, situations that do occur with these agencies caring for those with developmental disabilities and uh, vulnerable people. Obviously, there are requirements for shift work, for some uh, urgent situations that need to be addressed. And uh, we will continue to work with the agencies. Uh, I meet with them regularly. We certainly, on this side of the House, are listening. And, uh, uh, it's quite clear that uh, we will continue to work together with them on a solution. Thank you. Answer. Thank you. Your question, the member from Algoma, Manitoba. Thank you, Speaker. We, uh, my question is to the Premier. We re recently learned that the Liberal government has confirmation that Grassy Narrows First Nation is still being exposed to mercury poisoning through the contamination of the Wabagoon River. But the Premier says that the report that confirms this delivered to the government in September of 2016, never made it to her desk. The Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation says it wasn't a communication breakdown and that the ministries don't, and I quote, keep the Premier of the day in the dark. But if the Premier is to be believed, that is exactly what happened. This is a glaring mistake that shines light on incompetence in the Ministry of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation and this Liberal government in general. Why didn't the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation Question. tell the Premier that he has confirmation of a systematic poisoning of an entire Indigenous community? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Speaker, this is, uh, this is an extremely important issue. What happened at Grassy Narrows decades ago, Mr. Speaker, has to be rectified. And when I was Minister of then Aboriginal Affairs, Mr. Speaker, I travelled to Grassy Narrows. I met with the community. I met with the Chief, Mr. Speaker. I came back to uh, the Ministry and we, uh, you know, we, we worked to um, to dis determine, Mr. Speaker, if there was science available that it would allow us to move. One of the things that we were concerned about, Mr. Speaker, was that the disturbing of mercury in the water system would actually make the situation worse. As soon, Mr. Speaker, as I learned through a uh, meeting with uh, David Suzuki and uh, the Dr. John Rudd, Mr. Speaker, we, we learned that there was new science, that there was the ability to uh, clean up the system. That's why there's $85 million, Mr. Speaker, that is that is set aside that is, uh, at work. The scientists are there, Mr. Speaker. That cleanup is beginning. This has to be rectified, Mr. Speaker, and we are the government that has acted on that. Mr. Thank you. Supplementary. Again, to the Premier. The Premier is just one person. She has an entire team of staff, cabinet ministers working for her. It's hard to believe that no one in the Liberal government thought that this information was important or that it would save Indigenous lives. This report should have raised alarm bells and throughout this entire Liberal government. What disciplinary action is the Premier planning for her Minister of Indigenous Re Relations and Reconciliation for this potentially life-threatening oversight? You know, Mr. Speaker, there should have been alarm bells in 19, the 1970s, there should have been alarm bells in the 1980s, there should have been alarm bells in the 1990s, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the fact is, it has taken until now for this government to act because previous governments did not take action, Mr. Speaker. And you know what? The reality is that it was not clear exactly what the science was, exactly what action should be taken, but we have now taken action. This was a poisoning of a water system, Mr. Speaker, that should not have happened. And what it does, Mr. Speaker, is it raises huge cautionary notes in terms of how we go forward, how we continue to work with our, uh, indig our indigenous with Indigenous peoples, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that such a thing never happens again. And that is 
is why that is why the minister of indigenous relations and reconciliation spends so much of his time Answer. working with communities working with chiefs we're going to be meeting with the chiefs of ontario today mr speaker because we know that those relationships have to change and so that Thank something you. like this never happens again you say it, please you say it, please Thank you. New question, the member from Etobicoke North. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Minister of Francophone Affairs, the Honourable Mary France Lalande. A year ago, Ontario became an observer nation in the International Organization of La Francophonie. It was a historic moment for all Franco-Ontarians, as well as for Ontario. I'm very proud to ask this question because, in fact, in my writing, I have a very active Francophone population. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Francophone Affairs remind us of the importance of this uh, event? The Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for Etobicoke North for his question. On November 26, 2016, I had the honor of representing Ontario, along with the Premier, at the first summit of the Organization of La Francophonie in Madagascar. I would like to thank Quebec, New Brunswick, as well as the federal government and the 83 members of this organization which supported our candidacy. During this summit, via, by video, I was able to directly address the leaders of the members of this organization. Our participation in this organization represents an unusual opportunity for Ontario, and it's one of the most significant uh, realizations of Ontario. Ontario will be able to showcase itself uh, before the members of this country. The, this is more than 2 billion people. It's an excellent and unique opportunity to become a member of this international organization and to put, move forward its priorities. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for her answer. It's a pleasure to recognize the Franco-Ontarian community on the international scale, as well as to recognize the role played by Quebec, New Brunswick, and the federal government. By interacting with the 83 members of this organization, it seems that Ontario will have more opportunities than ever with respect to the Franco-Ontarian population and for Ontario in general. Can the minister tell us more about the effects and the opportunities with respect to our status as an observer state of this organization? The minister. Again, I would like to thank the minister, or the member rather, for Etobicoke North for his commitment with respect to Franco-Ontarians. Since we became a member, we have showcased the profile of our province and showcased various important international events, the Montreal Conference, and various other events of this organization. We, were, we expressed our interest with respect to two specific areas, education and training, as well as equality between the sexes. We recently sent a delegation of six businesswomen from various regions of the province to the Women's Conference of La Francophonie in Romania. We facilitated the creation of partnerships between the Economic Society of Ontario and La Francophonie. We have a bilateral agreement to discuss future possibilities with the representatives of dozens of countries, Mr. Speaker. Our status as a member of this organization shows that there's a great momentum for La Francophonie in Ontario. My question is for the Premier. Last Wednesday, the Canadian press reported that despite the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation receiving a report in September of 2016 about cleanup of the mercury contamination in the English Wabagoon River upstream from the Grassy Narrows First Nations, the Premier had the audacity to say she never saw the report. No. Speaker, the report in its entirety can be found with a simple two-minute Google search. This is an issue which the government has had more than a decade to address. Is the Premier really saying that there is an entire year of inaction on this issue because her office couldn't perform a simple Google search? Thank you. Premier. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, I know the Minister of Indigenous Relations will want to speak to this, but I, I just need to uh, reinforce what I said in the previous uh, answer, Mr. Speaker. What happened at Grassy Narrows and the, the mercury poisoning in the water, Mr. Speaker, that we all know is, uh, is a hugely problematic thing for the community surrounding uh, that area, Mr. Speaker, that you know, should have not have happened in the first place. And then decade after decade, Mr. Speaker, there was no action taken. And part of the reason for that was that it wasn't clear exactly what the science was to get <laughs> that mercury cleaned up. We know now, Mr. Speaker, what has to be done. We have set aside $85 million. That $85 million, Mr. Speaker, is already working. There are scientists there, Mr. Speaker, who are getting ready to uh, put the, uh, the um, infrastructure and the mechanisms in place to get that water Answer. cleaned up, Mr. Speaker. There's more that needs to be done. We understand that. That's why we have set aside that money. We are the government that is taking action on cleaning up what should never have happened in the first place, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, this is an issue about competency and trust. This report, and I'm going back to the Premier with this, this report, yes, is the foundation of an $85 million cleanup fund, an important part of reconciliation with the Grassy Narrows and while BC Mong First Nation. Yet the Premier admits she knew nothing about this plan just last week. So this is very unsettling, Speaker. We would expect a premier to have command of all of her files. Who is to blame for this incompetency, and what is going to happen? Is it the premier's office or the minister? Who's going to be fired yeah. over this inaction? Thank you. Climate change. Minister of the Environment, Climate Change. Well, thank you, Speaker, and it's a uh, it's it. it, it it's an opportunity for me to uh, talk about some of the things that are that are happening in Grassy Narrows. Like my predecessor and the the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, and indeed the Premier, you know, our priority has been Grassy Narrows. It was the first community I visited when I became uh, Minister of uh, Environment and uh, Climate Change. We've been working, Speaker, with that community and uh, and Wabsamong White Dog uh, Indigenous community for many years to identify mercury, to put the right science in place so that we can begin the remediation, the mercury remediation of the Wabagong uh, English uh, River system. So last, uh, you know, yes, the, the, we have to, we've got the, the dedicated $85 million fund. We've already put in place $5.2 million. We have drills Thank on you. site testing right now. Thank you. The time for question period is over. The point of order of the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you, Speaker. I wanted to uh, introduce the International School of Cambridge, who have just been in uh, watching the end of question period. So, welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.